Hello, my name is Natalie Sweet, and I'm the program coordinator at the Abraham Lincoln Library and Museum in Harrogate, Tennessee. Hi, and I'm Jake Wynn. I'm the Director of Interpretation at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine in Frederick, Maryland, and the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum in Washington, D.C. And this is Civil War Connect, an ongoing conversation between our two museums about medicine during the Civil War and also its connections to today's COVID-19 pandemic. Now today we are going to be discussing hospitals, Civil War hospitals, how they run, how they were supplied, what they were like inside, and we might even pull out a few artifacts along the way that I have with me. So we ready to go, Jake? Ready to go. All right. So let's start uh, with this. There's a popular perception that Civil War hospitals were dangerous, disease-ridden places, and that soldiers who ended up in hospitals were actually lucky to make it out alive. Is that an accurate perception? That is not an accurate perception. Um, so by and large, most Civil War soldiers, if they experienced the hospital, um, many times it was the new general hospitals that had been established uh, starting in 1862. Uh, and from the records of those hospitals, we know that they were uh, highly survivable. Um, you know, if you went to one of those general hospitals, chances are you had an 80 plus percent chance of surviving, uh, which is pretty good considering they don't know about germ theory, they don't know about what causes disease and infection. Um, now, that being said, um, early in the war, hospitals were pretty, pretty nasty, pretty gross. Um, and battlefield hospitals were not always, um, they were not always the safest place I, places either. Um, many battlefield hospitals were established in barns, um, in uh, tents outside of barns, in private homes, those in buildings that were not adapted for hospital use. Um, those places could be pretty, pretty nasty. Um, however, uh, most often those hospitals were pretty short term. Um, the soldiers were not being cared for in those facilities or makeshift facilities for a long period of time before they were transferred to one of these permanent, um, semi-permanent um, uh, general hospitals that are established in places like Washington, and Philadelphia, Baltimore, Richmond, um, Atlanta, et cetera. Um, and those, those hospitals are the ones that um, have the, the high survival rate. So if you made it back to those hospitals, you had a pretty good chance of making it home. So for these hospitals, were they primarily being used to treat soldiers who'd been uh, wounded in battle, or are they also dealing with people who have caught various diseases during the Civil War? Yeah, the hospitals serve both purposes. Um, so you do see a lot, um, especially in the winter months, um, you see uh, these hospitals filling up with, uh, with patients with disease, um, typhoid fever, dysentery, and most common, although you see lots of other ailments as well, smallpox, um, does become a small, small scale issue um, within the armies, um, bigger issue amongst um, uh, refugee populations. Um, but you do see soldiers filling up hospitals um, with, with um, cases of disease. Um, but then in the summer months especially, um, you see that's the fighting season um, when the roads soften up, the weather turns warm, and the armies begin to maneuver. Um, this is when you see the, pa the hospitals fill up with, uh, with wounds, um, with soldiers who have been wounded on the battlefield, um, some cases horrifically um, brought back, and, and then they're going to be the ones cared for. Um, but oftentimes you do see um, these hospitals are going to be a mix of those with disease mixed with those who have suffered wounds on the battlefield. So you, you do see both in these hospitals. Um, in some cases, they will have wards specifically dedicated to um, particularly um, dangerous, um, you know, diseases and infections. So smallpox, they do understand about isolating patients because they know it could be transferred very easily from person to person. Um, and uh, for some uh, infections that'll, that'll spread, things like gangrene, hospital gangrene, which is believed to have been a staph infection, um, those are things that would be, um, patients would be isolated um, from, from the rest of the general hospital population. Right, it's interesting. I think a lot of uh, public perception of the Civil War, we are probably all a little bit at fault for being really heavily influenced by popular Civil War movies about that time period, or even from artwork that was developed at the time period too. So one thing I notice uh, in images that are related to uh, imagined drawings, not actual drawings from the time period, but uh, later popular culture, is how often 
uh, hospitals are depicted as just areas where limbs are just being sawn off here, there, and everywhere. Another thing we see a lot of, and I've brought along with me from our traveling kit that usually goes with me when we go to schools is a bayonet. Uh, images of battles where everybody is basically bayoneting everyone <laughs> against each other all the time. And at uh, the Abraham Lincoln Library Museum, we're lucky enough to be connected to Lincoln Memorial University. And one of our professors there is Earl Hess, a noted military historian. And he notes in his book, uh, The Union Soldier in Blue, talking about how even though, you know, we see all these images of people being bayoneted and then having to be carted off to these hospitals, be treated for bayonet wounds, that bayonet uh, mortality might have been somewhere like around 1% when you actually yeah. get roles. <laughs> Uh, so how common were things like bayonet injuries or sawing bones off in these hospitals? Yeah, so start with the uh, with the bayonets. Um, yeah, popular culture has you believe that uh, that bayonet charges and, and that sort of thing are uh, commonplace during the Civil War. They weren't. Um, this is uh, this is because I mean, there, there's lots of theories about this. Um, the one that I subscribe to most is that these are volunteer soldiers. These are not professional armies, by and large. That oh, I say not even by and large. These are not professional armies. They are they are volunteers, um, and they have had maybe a few months of training. And veteran units uh, may have had a few years in the army. Uh, these are men who, time and time again, cannot carry through a bayonet charge. Um, that is how these how armies in Europe fight. Um, you exchange small arms fire, but by and large, your military success or failure is going to be um, achieved at the end, the pointy end of the bayonet. Um, and uh, that takes a lot of courage, a lot of training, a lot of trust. Um, and American armies, time and time again, fail to do that. They fail to carry through um, bayonet charges to their to their endpoint. I don't blame them. That is a terrible thing. Um, hand to hand fighting awful and the few occasions where it does happen in the civil war are awful and terrible um but uh this is all borne out um by the the look by looking at you know what did patients suffer from in these battlefield hospitals and as you mentioned natalie uh the wounds from bayonets are less than one percent um, of the wounds seen in the hospital by and large 90 plus percent are small arms fire so this is the mini ball, um, bullets, uh, round balls, um, some cases uh, sh uh, shot and ball, um, you know, buck and ball, that's the term I was looking for. Um, those small arms fire are what causes 90, 90 plus percent of, of injuries. Um, and this, this kind of gets to that, you know, American soldiers didn't want to stab, you know, their, their counterparts, uh, whether they're wearing blue or gray um, with bayonets. It is, a brutal thing um, and so instead you see these units kind of instead of going through with their charge they'll stop 25 30 50 yards away and start just shooting at each other which is not great either um, and it ends up in, in high casualties but it's because they couldn't carry through those um, some of those assaults that is one theory um, and that's the theory that I subscribe to there's lots of other ones about why there's not much hand-to-hand -hand combat during the Civil War and bayonet charges um, are not something that is commonly seen. Um, we see it much more in popular culture. Yeah, so we might say that rather than thinking of this as being more deadly, we should probably view this as yes. being more deadly. Now, this exactly. is something else we pull out for our collection. This is a bullet that would have gone along with a rifle, which gives part of its name to that weapon because of these nice little lines that we see going around it. Within the weapons at the time period, there was rifling that had been added to weapons that gave the bullet a spin so that it had more accuracy. As I always tell kids when uh, we talk about how deadly these bullets were compared to previous periods and designs, uh, think about if you play football. If you want to make a football go straight, how do you make it go straight? You put your fingers on the laces and you give it a spin so that it has more accuracy. But uh, these bullets don't just cause interior damage of the top that's uh, physical, they're also bringing germs in with them when they hit the body too, aren't they? Yeah, and this gets to, um, this gets to the point about um, what you mentioned about amputations. Now this is what is common 
um, about the Civil War. Uh, field hospitals, you oftentimes saw amputations because of those mini balls, because of those bullets. Um, and not only did they cause terrible, horrific damage um, when they struck the body, those bullets like to flatten out and smash bone, um, leading to, you know, surgeons didn't have many options. Amputation is actually the safest one, um, most likely to give the patient a chance of surviving. But you're right, those bullets are moving, um, even though they're rifled, um, they are still black powder weapons, and so they are moving, those bullets are moving significantly slower than modern bullets. And what this means is those bullets can actually carry um, material with them from, uh, let's say these soldiers are fighting in line, so this is, this is brutal, I'm sorry. Civil War medicine is brutal, what can we say? Um, but in these soldiers marching in line, uh, in lines, which means that sometimes those bullets can travel through one soldier, carry bits of his uniform, bits of um, organic material from that soldier, uh, bone, uh, blood, other bodily fluids, carry it through one patient and put it into the next, uh, next soldier behind him. Um, and that is gonna be a, a horrific source of, of uh, infection um, in these wounds. Um, they don't have any treatment for those infections, so that makes it, you know, uh, you're, you're kind of out of luck there. Um, I was just having a conversation, um, a, a Zoom conversation with some other medical historians, um, and a story came up about um, famous case at Gettysburg where a, um, a soldier uh, was shot through the chest um, and a bit of his uniform ended up in his lungs. Um, the bullet carried the uniform, a bit of his uniform, and he coughed it up later. I mean, that's, I mean, that, that you're exactly right about what you mentioned about carrying um, bits of, of material um, with those bullets because they're, they're slow moving um, in comparison to my, modern firearms. Well, that's the stuff of nightmares right there. Yeah. And speaking of nightmares too, uh, those Civil War movies, I think we've, you know, we've seen Gone with the Wind has that very famous uh, image where Scarlet is, uh, in the hospital in Atlanta, and they want her to come help down hold the patient as they saw off the man's leg with no anesthetic. Uh, is Was that common? Was that something that was really common in the Civil War, or was that more for effect in the movie? Yeah, that, that's definitely 100% for the movie. Here is a disclosure for you. I've never seen Gone with the Wind. It's okay. Never seen it. I don't have any plans to either. Um, Perfectly fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, I, I've heard, I've seen the scene um, in particular. Yeah, it's, it's pure, it's pure myth. Um, and you see this in other, in other popular culture as well, not just with Gone with the Wind, um, that, you know, amputations are being done willy-nilly, chopping off arms and legs, holding patients down. Um, it, not true. They had anesthesia um, available. Um, patients weren't fully conscious when they're doing these surgeries. They're not fully asleep either. So there are some cases of, you know, patients being have had to be held down, but they're not conscious of what's going on. They're not going to remember it. They're not feeling pain when it's going on. Um, but we do see popular culture is kind of um, over the years, thankfully, has kind of caught up with uh, the knowledge of Civil War medicine. So something like Mercy Street, which was um, the museum, our National Museum of Civil War Medicine helped to uh, um, kind of collaborate and uh, ensure historical accuracy of that, of that TV series. Um, you do see more accurate representations of Civil War medical care and Civil War surgery, uh, the use of anesthesia. Um, you, you do see that come in. So uh, it's changing, thankfully. Um, and But popular culture, I think, is uh, very responsible for kind of the, a lot of the misconceptions about Civil War medical care. Um, and it's a big part of what we do is to try to, um, you know, start to decrease people's trust in those misconceptions and start to point them towards uh, the primary documents, the reports, the recollections of Civil War surgeons, and like, listen, like, this is the reality of, of, um, of what Civil War medicine was really like. Yeah, and you know, speaking of Mercy Street, that was going to be the next point I brought up because I think for a lot of audiences today, maybe you've not seen um, Gettysburg, that's that's one that seems to fuel popular imagination or Gone with the Wind, but a more recent depiction of Civil War hospitals has been Mercy Street, which you all consulted on, right? Yep, yep, yeah. we, were, uh, we were consultants. Um, you brought up Gettysburg, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to whisper something else. I don't like that movie either. 
Um, <laughs> um, yeah, this is, I'm, I'm just like, people are going to hate me now because I, I don't like the movie Gettysburg and I've never seen Gone with the Wind and I won't see it. So, um, well, one of, one of the great, uh, one of the great curses is being a historian is that when you actually know the history, uh, your partner will absolutely hate you going into any movie because you'll be like, that's not right. <laughs> That's not it's right. true. It's That's true. inaccurate. We're total killjoys at parties. Yeah, we're we're we we truly are. Um, until yeah, yeah. I was gonna say until we get a few glasses of wine, uh, but even then, it, it just is like it's not super entertaining for other people. <laughs> for us, we're having a great time. But, oh, uh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, with that in mind, with Mercy Street, uh, what? depictions of hospitals do you think have been most accurate and what are the biggest mistakes you think that filmmakers make um you know the the we have seen kind of an evolution of this over over the past couple of years you do see um more accurate representations of of civil war hospitals uh i think filmmakers making mistakes i think it's um you know a lot of them even if they're consulting um, you know, with historians, with a museum like ours, there's always this, there's always this um, battle that's going on between, you know, you, you want to give the audience kind of what they expect. Um, and in many cases, audiences haven't necessarily been, um, you know, educated about the realities of Civil War medicine by and large. Um, you know, we're working every, every day, working at the museum to do that. Um, but it hasn't fully sunk into culture. Um, and so what that means is like the filmmakers going to have kind of this this battle going on about you know you want to throw those people a bone and give them kind of what they expect in a civil war field hospital they expect you know a brutal awful place no anesthesia you could go on and on about those myths and then there's the historical consultants who are like no this is the reality this is the this is what was going on in those hospitals um and so that's kind of the eternal struggle um, at least I've seen in, in recent years. Mercy Street was kind of a great, um, you know, I, I have mixed feelings about the show as a show, um, but uh, medically, I think they did a pretty good job of progressing and, and moving audience expectations about Civil War medicine, um, which I think is going to be good um, for future Civil War films. Um, it's only a matter of time until we start to see more of them, I think. Um, they're, they're, there's always kind of, every couple of years we see a new one come out. Um, and so I'm hopeful that uh, we'll see a continued kind of momentum of more accurately representing Civil War medicine. It is brutal. I mean, you can't get away from the brutality of Civil War field hospitals. Um, that's, that is always ever present in those places. Um, but what I hope that filmmakers will do in the future is to understand that um, that, that brutality the, the, you know, was on the battlefield and these, these surgeons who are, are working to save lives are working to save lives. They're the humanity um, against the brutality of the battlefield. They're the humanity trying to put the pieces back together. And, and I hope that we see that more accurately represented in the future. Uh, nicely put. Uh to pivot back to purely looking at the past rather than looking at it pop with pop culture too uh we know that there were civilian hospitals prior to the war uh, were those that were running before the war did they go on to handle sick and wounded soldiers or did most military casualties end up in their own facilities so at the beginning of the war um these civilian hospitals there were not all that many of them um, and they were pretty small facilities by and large um, I'm thinking of the one here in Washington. I mean, before there was any major con conflict actually happening, that hospital filled. Um, you know, just with soldiers within the first couple of weeks, that hospital filled. You see that in other places as well. Um, Pre-existing civilian hospitals were small. Um, there is no health crisis of this scale in American history before the Civil War. So there was no reason to have big, big hospitals. And so those facilities got overwhelmed pretty quickly and that's when military authorities realize that they have to start investing in infrastructure uh investing in developing their own hospital systems um and so that's when you see um 
you know, the rise of military hospitals, uh, the end of the first year of the war, and then by 1862, you see them ramping that up, um, building facilities um, under the idea that, um, you know, Florence Nightingale, um, going back to the Crimean War about the idea of fresh air and um, cleanliness is really important. Um, and so those um, hospitals actually become far more advanced than the civilian hospitals that existed before the war, which in some cases were pretty dank, dark places that you didn't want to be. Um, so hospital care, civilian and military, improves radically over the course of the war. Now, thinking about uh, those kind of bureaucratic details of those hospitals. We've talked a lot about comparisons between the COVID-19 epidemic and uh, Civil War medical history. And there's been a lot of discussion about the role of the federal government and state governments in addressing medical crises. Uh, did states create their own military hospitals during the war or was that a national responsibility? That's a really great question and one that depends really on the time in the war, um, so early war, you see more state hospitals on both sides, um, but also uh, differences Union versus Confederate. Um, so Confederacy, um, we're going to have more state hospitals, and this is that idea of states' rights, states' rights. Um, and so they're going to be caring for their own um, soldiers in many cases. You see that in Richmond. Um, uh, states will actually establish their own hospitals for their men. Um, and uh, you see that in the, some of the northern communities, you see that as well. Um, at the early stages of the war, you'll see state relief organizations setting up their own facilities. Um, but that tends to go away um, on the federal side um, as the um, federal government kind of gets better about its own medical infrastructure. There is this belief that all men, no matter where they originate from, um, and I know we'll get to this in a little bit later, no matter what uniform they're wearing, um, Union or Confederate, should all receive equal treatment. Um, that they're non-combatants um, at that point, they're coming into these hospitals, who cares where they're from? They're in need of care and you're going to administer that to them. Um, Confederacy is going to have that idea as well. Um, Chimborazo, the largest Confederate hospital in Richmond, um, cares for patients um, of with you know, Union uniforms on as well, captured um, Union soldiers will be treated there um, in some cases, um, but they're gonna treat patients regardless of their state. Um, but you do still see states sponsoring their own hospitals. Um, and so it kind of goes along with the ideas of the respective sides and the conflict um, about, you know, their ideology about, you know, um, the North, a stronger federal government, centralized, kind of care for everybody together. Um, and you see it in the Confederacy, more of that state, um, states, states rights side, and, and they're going to have the state established hospitals. Okay, you know, that was interesting that you brought up too about what uh, wounded soldiers who came maybe from the other side could expect. And uh, in a previous week, I had brought up uh, the Michigan Relief Society provided its own particular nurses to be able to go and care for soldiers from that particular state. But I guess there was instances of uh, crossover and helping each other in those instances if it was needed, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, there, there is a change as the war goes on and becomes more brutal, um, becomes more, less of a I hate using the term, but like less of a gentleman's war um, and moves more towards total war um, as, um, you know, Sherman becomes famous for in 64 and 65. Um, you do see a, a change in kind of caring for the other side soldiers. Um, we have a letter in our collection from, um, a series of letters in our collection from a nurse who was at Gettysburg named Clarissa Jones. Um, she was from outside Philadelphia, um, and she went to Gettysburg to help as a volunteer nurse. And, um, you know, she went and, you know, kind of walked around the hospital wards um, and found that the Confederate wounded were not getting the same level of care as the, um, as the Union, Union soldiers were. And so she volunteered to help. Um, and so you do see that happening um, where there's, you know, they're not, there's an ideal um, that both sides get both better care um, and you give care regardless of, of whose side the soldier was fighting on. Um, but that doesn't always, um, that, that's not always the reality. Um, and things get a lot more brutal 
um, as you get to 63. Um, and this sees the rise of the prison camps as well, um, which could be a whole other topic for one of these videos. Um, one more clever. But, uh, <laughs> yep. <laughs> um, but uh, you see in 1863 with the Emancipation Proclamation, the Union Army starts using black men as soldiers um, and, and enlisting black men in the army. Uh, and Confederate response to that is to view them not as, as legitimate soldiers, but as uh, slaves in revolt um, and treating them as such. That means um, they're not gonna be exchanged um, as was the case earlier in the conflict. Um, they're in some cases going to be re-enslaved um, or they're gonna be summarily executed. And so in response to that, um, you know, Union Army is going to start doing some reprisals for, for that as well. And what this means is the war becomes more brutal, um, as well as the care for um, the opposite sides wounded, if you capture them, is going to degrade um, pretty rapidly in 1863, um, and especially in 1864, which is, uh, this is hard to imagine. I think of Gettysburg and Chickamauga, the two bloodiest battles of the war taking place in 1863, but 1864 is by far the deadliest year of the conflict, um, and you have already started to see this degradation in that ideal of caring for both sides regardless of what uniform they're wearing, because there were distinctions being made along color lines um, and, and the, the color of the skin of the soldier um, dictating on the Confederate side whether or not they're getting um, medic the same medical treatment, if any medical treatment at all. Um, and so that ideal starts to really recede and retreat as the conflict goes on. Yeah, we see that with a gentleman who was actually an African-American soldier with an uh our written collection we're lucky enough to have the papers of benjamin trail uh, who was a former school teacher free man his father had escaped from slavery and settled had seven sons and four of those seven sons went on to serve actually in the union army and benjamin trail kept up a lively conversation with those brothers about his experiences in the camps, uh, the unequal treatment, the pay that was received even in the Union Army, though they were fighting for the United States Army. But uh, Benjamin Trail was also an unfortunate casualty at the crater, the Battle of the Crater, and was one of those individuals that actually, you know, we talked about bayonet fighting not being uh, as common. That was one of the locations where it did come out. Uh, and we had assumed, we knew that he had died there and had assumed that uh, for a period of time because of a lack of documentation that he had died immediately at the crater. But we did, uh, well, we did not, but Edna Medford Green, who is at Howard University, has done some great research and has been researching with collection and working around. She's currently working on a project right now. Uh, discovered that he was probably around two weeks later found burial records and it goes back to that uh, lack of care because he's even though uh, he was a free man it was absolutely not seen that way by conf the confederacy whatsoever as uh, slaves in arms so he didn't receive that care uh, as well and uh, another thing i would question and bring up is uh, we know that as the war goes along, too, uh, whereas the North is able to pick up its industrial uh, capacity to be able to supply soldiers, uh, in the South, the ability to uh, produce materials and even to feed because of the focus on cash crops that didn't actually feed people, like cotton and tobacco, had limited the amounts of foods and there had been, an, uh, there had been the effort very early on in the war to cut off supplies from being able to reach in the South. How much of that decision to, uh, to limit medical care was related to the ability of uh, the hospitals to actually feed and provide materials to take care of those soldiers? Yeah, that's a really, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think it's, it's, it, I think you raise a good point um, that it is medical, medical supplies, the lack of medical supplies, lack of infrastructure, lack of personnel. Um, is going to uh, going to, to result in some less positive outcomes for for captured uh, Union soldiers who come into the care of Confederates um, during during the conflict. I think um, you know it, it's it, it's something that you need to keep in mind that we all need to keep in mind when we talk about kind of especially some of the Southern prison camps. Um, there there is you know in those hospitals in the in the prison camps there is a lack of ability to supply 
uh, these men that they are putting into really close quarters and jamming together in prison camps. You also see the same thing in hospitals as well. I mean, Confederacy can't feed its own men, can't feed its own civilians, let alone uh, feeding, you know, tens of thousands of captured enemy soldiers. So it, it, it does strain their abilities to, um, you know, the infrastructure that they had available just did not add up to being able to care for all of those men that suddenly came um, into their lines. So I think it is a, I think it's a good point to draw a distinction um, between, you know, some of the conditions in the in the prison camps, um, some of the conditions in Confederate hospitals for Union sold for Union captured Union soldiers, um, to to say that some of that is not the Confederates' fault um, in terms of it's not willful, um, it's not willful uh, mistreatment in some cases, um, but also important to uh, recognize that in some cases it was willful mistreatment, um, whether it's based on. Um, you know, the color of the soldier's skin, um, or, um, and this is the case down, down in Andersonville, um, and in, in some cases in Richmond's prisons as well about, you know, I don't want to go to the le level of torture, but, you know, of, of mistreatment, um, which did happen. And I'll say, um, I'm not one to say, you know, uh, I, I hate the term both sides, um, but uh, this is something that, you know, is seen in, in some northern prison camps as well, um, uh, mistreatment, um, you know, lack of supplies for, for captured Confederate soldiers. You see it right there in that Clara Jones account um, from Gettysburg um, that, you know, the soldiers were being cared for, um, you know, given less care than, than captured Union, or than Union soldiers in, in the hospital after Gettysburg. So um, it's, a, it's a complicated issue. I think we could probably dive into this in a, in a whole other video in, in more depth. Um, but uh, yeah, it's 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 a difficult, it's a tricky one to uh, to, to talk about. Now, as uh, we see in current day situations, anywhere the the full story of an event is uh, affected by so many economic, political, military aspects. Uh, often one thing cannot be pinpointed for being the be all end all reason that contributes to a situation being the way that it is. There can definitely be uh, factors that outweigh others, mm -hmm. but it's uh, the perfect storm of conditions right. that make it as terrible as it can be. So uh, too, I will, I will end with one final thing. We might think too about how a uh, soldier's ability to recover and be well, uh, could be tied to their diets that we had. We just did a lesson with some of our kids in our uh, Civil War Club at our museum, our Lincoln's Army, Lincoln's Letters, mm -hmm. where we were talking about eating healthy fruits and vegetables and how uh, soldiers didn't always have access to those good foods to help contribute and promote the best types of health mm -hmm. and that sometimes they fell sick because of a lack of good nutrition. There were lots of salt heavy foods like hardtack, uh, with uh, not only hardtack, beans, coffee, types of things that transport well, but, you know, maybe necessarily doesn't uh, make the best decisions for our bodies in the long run for promoting good health. So I have something with me. I'm going to see if you know what it is. Is that a meat jar? That is a meat jar. And not only is it a meat jar with actual meat in it. The meat in this is 155 year old military issued meat in a meat jar that one Civil War soldier thought, hey, I'm going to save this from, you know, once I come home from duty, I'm just going to store it away. It was stored in a jar and we hermetically sealed it with uh, materials from our uh, biology departments as the university went on. And so uh, this meat the side meat just keeps on trucking because of all the salt that was in it to preserve it so think about that fun thing being consumed in your body and that it can last 155 years <laughs> i'm disturbed indeed and that's <laughs> <laughs> and with uh that meat jar note uh it's time to wrap up a civil another civil war connect but we will be back next week to discuss more topics related to civil war medicine again we hope that if you have questions that you will share those with us uh comment in the 
areas of the social media, wherever you find it, if you find it on either of our museum pages, if you find it on YouTube pages, if you find it on Twitter, Facebook, wherever you find it, leave us a comment. We are looking uh, for that feedback and we may address your question in a future episode. So until then, my name is Natalie Sweet and I'm the program coordinator at the Abraham Lincoln Library and Museum in Harrogate, Tennessee. I'm Jake Wynn. I'm Director of Interpretation at the National Museum of Civil War Medicine and the Clara Barton Missing Soldiers Office Museum. And this has been Civil War Connect. Thank you for joining us.